we have a gathering song today, which we'll also sing at the end of service. Some of you may know it, uh, but I think to most of us, it's a bit new. It's we want to worship the Lord with all of our hearts. And then the second time we sing it, we say, I want to worship the Lord with all of my heart. So we're going to sing this. If you know it, of course, <coughs> join us as we get to know this song. be with you. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen, amen, amen. Good morning to you. I'm Pastor Richard Allen Farmer and to those of you who are here in the worship space and who are visiting us online, thank you for being here. We look forward to what God is going to do and say as we are gathered together today. I have four short announcements. And then Cleveland Robinson, who was right here. Uh, yes, Cleveland Robinson is going to give a word. I was sure I saw him. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Pastor-led Bible study will resume this Thursday evening at 7 p.m. We'll be looking at John chapter 3. If you're not on that Zoom invite list, please call the office, and we'll see to it that you get that link. On January 22nd, two weeks from today, uh, it is my intention to uh, present a 30 to 40 minute concert. This is in place of the full blown uh, Songs of the Shepherd, the pastor in concert, uh, which we did pre-COVID. But please invite your friends. There will be products for sale uh, at the conclusion of that service. It's a full day for us here. We will have a business meeting, short business meeting, right after worship service. There'll be products uh, out in the narthex. There'll also be, I think, light refreshments served because at 2 o'clock we will have a, a celebration of praise, uh, worship service, uh, a shorter worship service, uh, mostly of song uh, that afternoon. So it'll be a, a full day, uh, but come prepared uh, for all of that on January 22. On the first and third Sundays, my third announcement, I want to remind you that we ask you to make a contribution to two funds in our church. We receive one offering on Sunday morning, but on the first and third Sundays, we ask you to divide your offering differently and give an additional offering to our Samaritan ministry on the first Sunday and our Deacon's Fund on the third Sunday. And lastly, I want to thank all the volunteers that served yesterday in our food distribution. I was out of town and didn't get back into town until uh, five o'clock in the evening, but I heard uh, that it was a great success just in terms of pulling off this volunteer ministry. I'm told that 11,000 pounds of food were distributed to our neighborhood 
uh, people, and we are very grateful. Will all those who served yesterday please stand? All of you who took part in the food distribution yesterday, and it takes an army of volunteers. Just remain standing, please. Remain standing for a few minutes, uh, for a few seconds. I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you. We, we do a lot around here, and we cannot do it without volunteers. And you stepped up, and I thank you, thank you very, very much. There are a lot of folks at Crossroads. Uh, look around. This is a, a wonderful uh, representation, these folks standing, but it's not nearly enough. Uh, we have a lot of folks here at Crossroads who don't do, what's the theological word? They don't do squat. They don't do anything. They just come on Sunday morning, suck up some spiritual energy, and leave. They don't give of their time. They don't give of their substance. They don't, they don't do anything. And you are not those people. Thank you, thank you, thank you for showing up yesterday. That's wonderful. It's a wonderful report. Cleveland Robinson. Are you convicted now? <laughs> I love this church. If we have guests visiting us in the sanctuary, good morning to you. And certainly our guests at visit by way of social media, good morning. And as always, my Crossroads family, which I love dearly, good morning, good morning, and good, good morning. morning. I only have a couple of announcements. Ursha's meeting on Sunday, January the 8th, there will be a meeting of all Ursha's in room 22, immediately following a service. This will be a time to review and recognize. Thanks for your service to the ministry, and I hope that you will be able to attend from Walter Murray. Church need. It is time to undecorate the sanctuary church Please join us on Saturday, January the 14th from 1 to 4 p.m. to take down our decorations and pack them away until next year. We need your help, about eight or 10 workers. We can get this job done quickly. If you need any information on regarding this, please contact Nancy Scott or Jethorki Jones. And my final uh, announcement is missionary visit. On Wednesday, January the 11th, we will have the uh, privilege of hearing about what God is doing in North Africa and the Middle East, MENA. Jamil Shabao, and I, hopefully I didn't, uh, Shabo. Jamil Shabo, who served, uh, who oversees the uh, work at colleges and universities in the MENA region, will be at Crossroads to talk with us about how awesome the Spirit is calling people to God. We are setting up two different times to, to meet Jamil, one of which will be at 4 p.m. and the latter at 7.30 p.m. More information on this, you may contact uh, Bill Smalls or Nancy Scott. If you would stand for our call to worship. <clears throat> Here's the locator on our overheads. Oh God, our refuge and our redeemer. The promise of new life in Christ is like a breath of fresh air in these disturbing times. When I have a seek the truth and to worship and adore you if you are safe from all alarms. We'll now have our opening song.
our hymn of the month. We're going to sing it every Sunday this month. Next month there'll be another. Uh, I want you to be familiar with classic hymns. This hymn is over 100 years old, and you shouldn't go to heaven without at least experiencing it one time. So we, we insert these that we might simply become aware of and get educated in some of the classic traditions of the church. So sing it. Um, you heard it, maybe some of you, for the first time last Sunday. So today it's more familiar. Next Sunday it'll be even more familiar. There are five Sundays this month, so you get to sing it five times. <laughs> Stanza three. The raging storms may round us beat, but we have a shelter in the time of storm. Amen. Let's sing. prayer of confession. If you need to take a seat, please do so. Now this is our prayer of confession, so we want to read it meditatively. It is a prayer. Almighty, Almighty God, God, we, we confess, confess that, that we often, often dethrone you, you in our hearts. When, when we, we seek self-sufficiency and when and we, we allow fear, fear to, to paralyze us. us. We find it very difficult to be in constant submission to you, O Lord. God, forgive us for selling you short. We know the Lord our God is omniscient and omnipresent, almighty, and yet our trust in you is still small. God, help us, our hearts, never to fail to see that you are a big God, bigger than all our inadequacies, Bigger, bigger than, than all, all our challenges, challenges. Sweet, sweet Jesus, Jesus you are faithful even when our trust is shaken up in the storm. storm. And the assurance of pardon. Jesus says, blessed are, they, though, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. He promises to hear us and to meet our every need. Our part is to trust him completely, to honor him at every turn. Thank you, Lord. Lord, that you are totally trustworthy. And the people of God in agreement said, Amen. Amen. And because he's trustworthy, our next song is to give him glory and to give him the praise. Because guess what? He woke us up this morning and Amen. we're here. So Amen. let's sing this together. Give him the glory. Give him the glory. Give him the praise. Give him the glory. Give him the praise. Give him the praise. Woke me up.
This is the new part, so I'm going to sing it through one time. It says,
That sounds so good. He loves when we praise him. Say it again. not sure who uh, put be prepared for living in our multi-ethnic community up there but that's fine that fits right in <laughs> and, um, if that was Maggie or who added that but that's great um, my name is Nancy Hulse and I'm here to talk about an upcoming opportunity called perspectives perspectives first of all perspectives is a movement that is awakening the body of Christ to, to pursue the fulfillment of God's global purpose within every people group for his glory. Second, Perspectives is an education course that examines the story of God fulfilling his purposes from four vantage points, biblical, historical, cultural, and strategic. And three, Perspectives is an organization in the U.S. and across the world made up of thousands of volunteers, staff, and supporters who are passionate, missional, caring followers of Jesus who are eager to co-labor with him as he unfolds the living story of his glory. Of course, I would love to recruit students or volunteers from, for the upcoming class in Clarkston but today, I really want to focus on the word passion. We have people in this church who are very passionate about certain areas that they've been called to. We know we're passionate about, there's a, you know, we're passionate about OCC Operation Christmas Child. We're passionate um, about um, children's ministries, and we have leadership in this church who are very passionate about making sure the next generation meets and has a lifelong relationship with Christ. We have ministries that are passionate about women's ministries. We have leaders in this church who lead those roles. And we have many other groups in church and ministries in our church who are led with people with passion, such as um, the food ministry or the, the meal giveaway um, downtown. But what does passion look like? Is it an emotional response we feel when God is calling us? According to corporate recruiters who are always asked to find people for different jobs who have passion for a job that they don't even have yet, According to the recruiters Deschanel and Paracal, the answer is no. Here's what they say. You can be passionate without being emotional. In fact, most people are. 
because passion is really a priority statement. It's about importance. In other words, if you are passionate about something, you have decided that it is important enough in your life to spend the time, energy, and effort to get really good at it and focus on it. Just like the pastor is passionate about his piano playing and we are the recipients of that blessing. It's something that gets priority. It doesn't mean you have attached emotion to it or maybe not yet. It just means that the things you are passionate about are important to you. I don't consider myself a very outwardly emotional person, but I have passion for global missions and the USA is part of global. How and when did missions become important to me? There were key points in my conversion and growth that I can point to. First, at a camp where I first met Christ, the week-long speaker was a missionary from Papua New Guinea. He peppered the teens with real stories of headhunters and cannibals and the power of Christ in redemptive stories. Many teens that week were saved, and it left a deep mark on my life. I started attending a new church where global missions was a strong focus. Secondly, I attended the Urbana, Urbana Missions Conference as a college student in 1972, and again as an adult in the 2000s. I was one of hundreds of students who made a written commitment to global missions during that week. Thirdly, I attended a perspectives course in 2006 in Duluth at a Korean church where I saw uh, mostly Korean students in the class who were on fire for global missions. This was really a turning point for me as my eyes were opened to seeing scripture as it represents God's desire for the whole world. Of course, I knew by this time I was not going to be a missionary overseas, but that didn't mean I couldn't still be an encourager and a facilitator for missional pursuits, including my financial support. In 2021, I played a small role in the perspectives course that was being taught in Clarkston. This year, I'm the admin for the upcoming class. I tell you these things because I realize that my experiences in mission are not the same as your experiences or even uh, your journey with God uh, since your younger days. You probably have different God-led passions. I hope that your passions lead you to action. But if you do not have any passion for the things God has passion for, this might be a good way to kindle a passion for mission or for other areas in your life. You will hear 15 dynamic speakers worship and share with others in your class. The course is three hours every Tuesday night for 15 weeks, starting January 24th. It's a commitment in an age of non-commitment. It involves reading and some writing. The first two weeks of the course are free. This Tuesday night, there, the 10th, is a shortened preview and introduction night. I would be happy to speak with you more at any time about the class. This class is offered every semester throughout Atlanta, in other locations, and at other times, as well as across the United States. Dawn Ellis is our prayer coordinator, um, and she can also answer questions. Uh, she and her team have been praying for this course for months. Pastor Farmer is a prospective speaker as well. If you cannot attend, would you please pray for the success of this class, especially in Clarkston, as our hope is to reach out to the multiple um, um, ethnic and um, multicultural people in that area who are Christians and who have the opportunity to speak to others in Clarkston and around Atlanta uh, who don't know yet Christ. All is for God's glory in the world. Amen. Thank you.
Thank you, Nancy. Before we go to prayer, I want to acknowledge the presence of our Convergence Church partners. I say partners because we are in ministry together. They are a church that is uh, based in Stone Mountain. They have their worship services on most Sunday afternoons right here in our building. And on the second Sunday morning, they are usually here in worship with us. Uh, I want to make sure that you get to know the Convergence Church family. Uh, their pastors are Corey and Jade Lee. They have a daughter, Sarah, a son, Sammy, and another son whom we call Deuce. He's Corey Lee the second, but we call him Deuce, and he is He's, he's, an, he's an energetic boy. <laughs> There's Darius James is part of that congregation, his wife Ebony. I have my cheat sheet here, their son Legend, their son uh, Conquer. Uh, the Lees, just stand up. I'm sure many people know you, but I want you to see Corey and Jade Lee. They give leadership to the Convergence Church. <laughs> Curtis Smith and his family are here. Curtis and his wife Paige. They have one son, Elijah, and three daughters, Sophia, Hannah, and Micah Rose, who is edible. <laughs> I, I, have, I have kissed Micah Rose's cheeks more than is probably legal, uh, but I, I have done it. Uh, but the Pages, Curtis and Paige, I'm sorry, the Smiths, Curtis and Paige Smith, would you stand, please? Let me get to see you. The Ruckers are here, uh, Devante Rucker and his wife, Amani, uh, and their son, Chosen, and their daughter, Faith, and their daughter, their most recent daughter, Hadassah. Would you stand, Ruckers? Uh, and I, I hope I haven't left anybody out. Those are the couples I know and the families I know from Convergence. Any other Convergence folks here? Uh, Sean Hildebrand is part of that congregation. She's out today. Uh, who, oh, yes, yes, yes. Is that Darius? No, that's not Darius. Uh, let's see. Uh, Deontay, thank you very much. Deontay Thomas and his wife, Hawa, and their son, Dean, their son, Dalen, and their daughter, Danya. They had a sale on D's, <laughs> apparently, when they were naming their children. Uh, is the rest of your family here, Deontay? All right, well, good to see you, brother. Good to see you. We continue to give thanks to God. When the Convergence Church is here, we have babies. You know I love babies, you know. You know, I love babies, and I love the energy that's in the room when Convergence is with us. So thank you for being here, and we continue to partner together uh, in the Word of God. Uh, I remind you, saints of Crossroads, that we are not in competition with any church in Stone Mountain or in the greater Atlanta area, we are not in competition. If it's a gospel preaching church, we are not in competition with them. We're in partnership with them. There are thousands of lost people in Atlanta, and some of them are not interested in our style of worship. They're not coming here, but they will go to another church where the service is more palatable for them and is more what they're looking for. And I say amen, hallelujah. Go someplace where you can grow. If this is not the place for you, then find some place. But go somewhere and get right. Amen, 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 amen. So let us continue to pray for our colleagues and partners in ministry. We have much to pray about. You see the list of those who are sick, homebound, bedbound, uh, in great need of prayer. You see the name of the bereaved, those who are doing their grief work. We continue to pray for these. We continue to pray for our nation. Just, uh, just listening to current events can be disheartening. I think, but you folks, doing all this 
messing around. Come on, let's get some work done. Spending all this time trying to choose a leader, trying to choose a speaker. Come on, man. Nine times you vote. Come on. Let's, there, there are better ways we can spend our time. Let us continue to pray for our nation and its leaders. I'm going to give you some time to pray. Then it will be my joy to lead you. Let us pray. Holy God, we acknowledge you to be our only hope in a world filled with rancor, and bitterness, and hatred, and hopeless situations, we turn to you. As we sang, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh Lord, we praise your name. All the glory, all the praise. Oh Lord, we praise your name. There is none like thee. Oh sweet wonder. Thank you, Jesus, the Son of God for hearing our prayers, for interceding for us as we approach your throne. Thank you for opening up the way between us and our God creator so that we may know him. We bless you. We bring before you these listed and thank you for the privilege of being their brothers and sisters and standing with them and calling them and checking on them and visiting them, sending cards to them and reminding them that they are not forgotten or alone. Thank you. Some of them were visited just last Sunday and served communion. They were prayed with and prayed for. And we thank you that they are part of our family. And we pray that we would not fail them or fail you by failing to express concern for them. We thank you for the opportunity to worship publicly without shame. Thank you for an open time of praising your name, singing your songs, hearing your word proclaimed. We thank you for this day in which we live. Those of us who like technology are finding ourselves delighted. New stuff coming out all the time. We are elated that we get to do so much with so little effort due to the technology we have. We thank you for time-saving devices, for access to literally a world wide web. Thank you for the opportunity to learn, to grow. This is a great day and we praise you for advances made in areas of ministry and technology and business. We thank you. 
thank you for what you're doing in each of our specific circumstances, for the way you are at work in our homes, in our health challenges, in our travel. You've been with us. You've kept us safe. And we thank you. We pray for the United States of America. It is our home, and we thank you for the opportunities we have had because we live here. We thank you for the freedoms we enjoy, for the opportunities we have. We pray for our leaders. Some of them have not a clue as to what they're doing. They need your guidance. We pray for our congresspersons, for our senators, for our governors, for our mayors, for our county commissioners, for leaders on every level. We pray for the president of these United States and the vice president and their cabinet. As meetings are held and decisions are made, may people operate from a place of responsibility and sobriety and seriousness about the task. Deliver us from ourselves, we pray. If left to ourselves, we would simply do that which bolsters our self-interest teach us what it is to serve other people, to make decisions in light of what is best for the nation, for the populace. Help us. We give you thanks that you have not forsaken us. You have promised to be with us. In spite of our rebellion, our disobedience, you, God, are with us, and this is our hope. Now be honored in all we do and say in the rest of this service, in our day-to-day -day activities. May we honor you in every way. We ask these things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, Amen. Everybody sang. Everybody sang. Amen. If you're visiting the Crossroads Church for the first time in a morning worship experience, would you please stand where you are? We'd like to acknowledge your presence. Surely we have, ah, wonderful, wonderful. All right. Ah, several. Wonderful. Please remain standing until the mic has been brought to you. We'd like to hear your name and where you're visiting from, either another city or uh, tell us if you're local. Yes, sir. Dorian Campbell and Mrs. Campbell, we are from Stone Mountain here. From Stone Mountain, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for coming to worship with us today. Uh, my name is Wayne Owens, and I'm visiting here from uh, Bedside Baptist. From Bedside Baptist. Right. That's a very popular church. It's a very popular church. Yes, yeah, right up there with Mattress Methodist. And they are... <laughs> That they are growing congregations, growing churches. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My, my name is Velma Russian, and I'm from here in Stone Mountain. Oh, right here in Stone Mountain. Yes. Wonderful. Local. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Anybody else? Did we miss anyone else? Yes, this young lady? My name is Reginny Hutchinson, and I'm visiting from St. Thomas. From St. Thomas. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if you're visiting with us online for the first time on a Sunday morning, 
I would really like to know that. If you drop a note to Richard Allen Farmer, 1951 at gmail.com, I promise you a prompt, speedy, personal reply. That's Richard Allen Farmer, 1951. The Allen is spelled A-L-L-E-N. Richard Allen Farmer, 1951 at gmail.com. Please just put in the subject line, was with you this Sunday morning, and I'd be delighted to respond to you. Bless you, bless you. Well, it's giving time at Crossroads. I want to thank you. We close the year very strongly. Uh, at the end of 2022, we were not in debt. Uh, we did not have uh, a shortfall. Uh, you have been faithful, and I want to thank you. Thank you, thank you. With offering in hand, please stand. If you don't have an offering in hand today, uh, perhaps you have given online, you've authorized a bank draft, you give once a month, and you already gave uh, for this month, you gave last Sunday, uh, you bring a check by the church building, and perhaps you're not giving physically in this morning service. Uh, I still want you to participate in this stewardship prayer. And would you please hold in your hand either an offering or anything that represents your offering yourself and your substance and your resources to God. And let us pray. God the giver, we thank you for these resources you have entrusted to us. As we give, we do so with grateful hearts. With cheerfulness, we return a portion of your gifts that Crossroads Church may care for the financially distressed, spread the gospel to the nations, address economic and political injustices, create and sustain ministries that develop disciples of Jesus the Christ. As we give, we pray that you, Holy God, will teach us how to give. May our motives be pure, our hearts be glad, and our hands be open. We pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Father God, we are grateful. We are thankful. We adore you. We thank you for those individuals this morning who had the ability to give. We ask a blessing over those who had a desire to give, but could not this morning. For we know that the greatest gift is a humble heart. Now we ask you to bless these offerings, Father God. Multiply them for the edification of your kingdom. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Children ages four and five in grades one through first through fifth are excused for children's church. told my son recently, I said, I'm surprised you even have cheeks because I tried to suck them off your face every day when you were a baby. I mean, I kissed that boy profusely. I'm surprised he's got skin left. Um, but it is a wonderful treat to hear uh, the sounds of our babies and toddlers and little ones. It's a good time. Uh, some of you have expressed your love for me and your concern for my health, and I promise to keep you updated uh, on all things. Uh, this Thursday, uh, I have an appointment with the pulmonologist. I told you that I called a pulmonologist whose office gave me an appointment for March, which was not acceptable, and our own Patty Dinkins Matthews gave me the number of her pulmonologist and I said is he taking new patients yes he'll see you pretty immediately so this Thursday I have an appointment with a pulmonologist I'm very happy about that <clears throat> just to address the shortness of breath that I've been experiencing and I am uh, eager to just get some answers if it is just because I'm taking a medication for rheumatoid arthritis and one of the side effects is fatigue fine, but just tell me why I'm short of breath. I, I just need some answers. So I got things to do. <laughs> I got plans. I want to read from the book of Daniel. If you're able, would you please stand as we honor the word of God. The book of Daniel, chapter 6. I want to read the 24th through the 28th verse from the New King James Version of the Scriptures. And the king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. That's the after story. Some of you know the story of Daniel in the lion's den. He was in the lion's den, was not harmed at all. After that, those who had accused Daniel went into the lion's den. They had a different result. Then King Darius wrote, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered 
in the reign of Darius, and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. You may be seated. Oh, you are still there. May I hear the key of A flat, please? Ah, this is the day that the Lord has made. privilege of hearing now your word. Thank you that we do not live in some system whereby the church must go underground and meet in secret. But thank you for this opportunity to be right on this corner, out loud, singing, praising you, giving thanks to you without shame. We rejoice. We are glad you have given us this day this day that you made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Now open to your people your word, we pray. May this preacher and this people find themselves rejoicing in your truth, and we shall bless your name and give you thanks evermore. We stand in awe of you. Speak, Lord. We bind the enemy that would come in to steal and to destroy, to stand against them in the name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is against you, yes, evil yes. one. Now grant us freedom in thy word, and we shall rejoice. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Be glad, be glad, be glad.
highest praise hallelujah. for your healing power Lord hallelujah 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 one more time hallelujah Touch his body, Lord. Hallelujah. For we know that you know the answer. Hallelujah. You know why he's short of breath, Lord. But we give you the honor and the praise. For you are a healer, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we thank you, Lord, hallelujah, for restoration. Hallelujah. For knowing the answer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is your servant, Lord God. Serves you selflessly, Lord God. Hallelujah. And we thank you, Lord, for your healing, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, musicians, for all you bring to our service, AV folks. Daniel chapter 6, verse 28. All this month, I want to pursue this idea of a very prosperous new year. Going at the theme of prosperity, which means to thrive from various texts. 
Daniel chapter 6, verse 28. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. I don't like the way the word so is being used in public discourse today. I'm a professional public speaker. Language is the currency of my profession. I listen carefully to public discourse, to the way people speak, to the way journalists speak, uh, the news, NPR stories, and I'm really disturbed by the way the word so is used. It's become a filler word that appears usually at the beginning of a sentence. It's supposed to signal the continuity of thought or a story, but in current discourse, it serves no grammatic no grammatical or linguistic function at all. I was watching a video of a salesperson walking the viewers through a motorhome. Camera comes on and the salesperson begins the video with, so I'm Brian Pitts. I thought, so what? 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 Why so? I'm Brian Pitts. So I'm Brian Pitts. I read a text from a friend whose adult child came home for a visit. The text said, so Garfunkel came home today. I thought, so? It's Garfunkel came home. What, what's the so? Why not simply Garfunkel came home? So is an adverb or a conjunction and should help us connect ideas. This text says, almost as a summary statement, so Daniel prospered. But there, so makes sense. It connects us to the story which is told before that verse. Perhaps you know the story. King Darius's advisors have written a law the advisors actually wrote the law and just asked the king to sign it. Always very dangerous. The law said, King Darius is to be worshipped, and anyone who worshipped any other being than King Darius should be thrown into a den of hungry lions. That was the law. And Daniel is caught praying to the living God and he's reported. The problem is that the king likes Daniel and he doesn't want to see Daniel thrown into the den of lions. In fact, he thought so highly of Daniel. Well, I don't want you to think I'm making this up. Turn to the beginning of chapter 6. And you read these words. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors of whom Daniel was one. That the satraps, satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. The king really liked Daniel. Daniel had skills. Daniel was likable. The king even gave thought to giving him reign, giving Daniel reign over all things. And by praying to Yahweh, the living God, Jehovah, Daniel has broken the law that the satraps and governors put in place and they want to see Daniel punished. They want to see him thrown into the lion's den. And King Darius does not want to punish Daniel. But the king has to say face. He can't be a chump. 
can't be a punk. Sign the law. And, well, yeah, Daniel. Yeah, Dan's a nice guy. We'll give him a pass. He's got to got to step up and do what he said he'd do. Verse 11 of chapter 6 of Daniel. These men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree and said, uh, King, have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, This thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself. I, I think it's because he let himself be manipulated into signing this decree that he himself did not write. So he's really annoyed with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. Ah, you know the story. The king wants da Daniel to live. But he's got to save face. So Daniel is thrown into the den of lions. And the lions did not harm him. They didn't break one of his bones. They didn't go uh, lick him. They didn't sniff around him. They left him alone. Like the old preachers of my youth said, and Daniel was in the lion's den. And the lions got lockjaw. <laughs> they weren't even interested in biting him. In fact, Daniel testifies and says, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. The king is relieved because he likes Daniel. The king was also a little bit angry. He'd been used by these guys who wrote a decree and then asked the king to co-sign it, so to speak. And after Daniel is delivered from the lion's den, the king thinks about those advisors that set him up. And the king thought to himself, Daniel is not the person that needs to be punished. You guys are. And these folks, says chapter 6, verse 24, were put into the den of lions, and they were not delivered from the mouths of the lions. The king now makes another decree, this time of his own writing that the God of Daniel is to be worshipped rather than King Darius. The king, a smart man, says, you know what, I've just seen, y'all don't need to be worshipping me because I can't help you. Y'all get thrown in the den of lions, I'm not going to be able to deliver you. But the God of Daniel just did something outstanding when he delivered Daniel. We ought to make this God the God of worship, the object of worship. So, here the word is used properly. So this Daniel prospered. That's the text verse. So, in light of all that has gone on, let me connect the story. The narrator says, so, in light of all that has happened, we've watched Yahweh deliver his servant. We've watched the king humbled 
by the action of God in behalf of Daniel. So this Daniel guy prospered. Why did Daniel prosper? That, that was my question of the text. I want to suggest just one answer. I don't have three points. I have one. Daniel prospered. And remember, the Hebrew understanding of prosperity is to thrive, to advance. It is not simply material gain. Prosperity preachers uh, tend to make us think that prosperity has to do only with material gain. But prosperity in the Hebrew mind is to advance, to progress, to go along with the understanding that that progress only takes place because one is in a relationship with Yahweh, with the God who created us. Why did Daniel prosper? I, I want to suggest that he prospered because he practiced spiritual discipline, particularly the discipline of prayer. Oh, pastor, is that all you got? Give us something deep. That is deep. You're going to have a better year. We're going to have a better year as we take more seriously the discipline of prayer. Go with me to chapter 2 of the book of Daniel, verse 20. This is after Daniel has interpreted a dream for the king. Then the secret was revealed, says verse 19 of chapter 2. To Daniel in the night vision, so Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness. And light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made to me, made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. Daniel's praying. In my tradition, well, not so much in my home church tradition, but in the black Pentecostal tradition, <clears throat> There are women and men who give themselves primarily to the discipline of prayer. They're called prayer warriors. And in many traditions, in many churches, these, and it was mostly women, but there were men as well, but these women would arrange a shut-in and they would lock themselves in the church building for three nights three days and three nights. These are usually retired women. And they would pray almost the entire time. They would couple it with fasting. They would take breaks for drinking water. But other than that, they were fasting and praying. And they'd say, they'd say, Mother Burgess is scheduling a shut-in for January 6 to 9. And you go there to the church and she and an army of prayer warriors are praying for three days. Have you ever taken prayer that seriously? That you shut everything down and just pray for a couple of days? Well, that, that is some intense praying. Daniel prospered, I want to suggest, because he took ever so seriously what it was to commune with God. Go back to chapter 6, our text chapter, verse 10.
Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Daniel had a habit of praying. Some folks, I don't, there might be some here, but some folks don't pray every day. They pray maybe before a meal, but they don't pray daily. They pray when there's a problem. They pray when there's a crisis, but they don't have a prayer habit. They don't have a prayer discipline. They don't have a prayer custom. But did you read this? Three times a day. Some folks don't pray even one time a day. Daniel knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. And it wasn't because there's a problem. As was his custom since early days. He's been praying. I've been one of Tony Dungy's pastors for 40 years. He was a member of the church I pastored in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the 80s when he was with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Some of you might know that his son took his own life in 2005. I said to Tony and Lauren during that very, very difficult time. By that time, he was with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and I went to Florida to be with the family for that time. And I said to the Dungies, if you were just showcasing Christians, you could not have made it through this awful season like you've come through it. They didn't just call on God when their son took his own life. They had been praying. They had been a faithful, seriously Christian couple. And it was easier to get through that horrible, horrible time because the conversation that they had been having with God continued. So Daniel prospered. He prospered and he prayed, but he had been doing that since his early days. Don't miss this. Daniel didn't just decide to pray when they threw him in the lion's den. He'd been praying. Some of us only call on God when we're threatened when things are not going like we'd like them to go, when we've lost our job, when our child has gone wayward, oh, I, we, we better pray. Daniel said, all right, this is a bump in the road, but uh, you know, it's not going to change my day. I'm, I'm still going to pray. That's been my custom. You all got a problem with that? Well, do what you need to do. I'm going to pray. In fact, I, I would suggest that there are some people who, if they had heard uh, that they were about to be thrown into a den of lions or to a fiery furnace because of their faith, I dare say there would be some who would rewrite uh, the covenant between them and God. <laughs> Daniel seems not to even be flustered. He prays as he's always prayed. The three Hebrew men, they are threatened with being thrown into the furnace, and they essentially say, King, do whatever you need to do, but we don't need to renegotiate. We don't need to give you an answer concerning this. Uh, the God to whom we give worship uh, is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace and from your hand too, O King. You're not all that. All the power resides in our God. Daniel thrives, prospers, I want to suggest, because he practiced 
spiritual discipline, particularly the discipline of prayer. Spiritual disciplines are usually categorized into two lists. There are activities in which we engage and there are those practices from which we abstain. They're called disciplines of engagement and disciplines of abstinence. The disciplines of engagement are worship, celebration. This list is from Dallas Willard's book, Spirit of the Disciplines, but uh, several writers uh, sometimes list them differently. Disciplines of engagement are worship, celebration, confession, guidance, fellowship, journaling, meditation, mourning, prayer, service, and study. These are things which we do. Then there are disciplines of abstinence. That is things we do not do. Solitude, silence, fasting, secrecy, simplicity, frugality, chastity, sacrifice, and submission. Beloved, I wish for you a very prosperous new year having nothing to do with material gain, having all to do with our digging in, leaning in to the possibility that we could be better prayers. I've been walking with the Lord now for over 50 years. I've taken Jesus seriously since I was 12 years old. I am, as I close this, I, I'm very frustrated by my prayer life. I don't pray as often as I need to. I do pray every day, but I don't, I don't spend as much time as I should in prayer. I find myself praying the same prayer over and over. I, I need to freshen the language of my prayer. In 2023, I want to prosper in my prayer life. So Daniel prospered. I want to suggest that it is because he took prayer ever so seriously. And he became a better prayer with each passing year. I pray for us all that we will never apologize for being worshipers, and we will never apologize or back down because we want to pray. And you know that auntie you had. Well, let's, let's pray. Say, oh, I've got to pray again. Come on. <laughs> or that uncle you had who had the longest prayer at a Thanksgiving dinner, <laughs> and you're smelling that turkey. Come on, hunk. Wrap it up. Wrap it up. <laughs> There's really nothing wrong with a long time spent in prayer. You binge watch a series, you'll give that six hours of your time. Eight hours, ten hours of your time while you watch both seasons or three seasons of such and such. But a 15 minute long prayer is too much. Shame on us. I wish for you a very prosperous new year. So Daniel prospered because Daniel prayed. Let us pray. Holy God, I pray that you'd place on us all the spirit of Daniel. That we might develop a discipline, a passion for prayer. Make of some of us in this room prayer warriors who might call for a shut-in spend two or three days 
in intense prayer. Some of us are embarrassed by our prayer discipline. We pray that you would fix us, help us, teach us, that we might love what it is to commune with thee, to sit before you in silence, to sit before you in conversation. Grant that we may honor you by our lives. Spare us, deliver us from mechanical prayers that require no thought. And make us, we pray, thoughtful worshipers who love to sit in your presence. Thank you for our brother Daniel, for his example. Oh God, who did deliver Daniel, deliver us, we pray. these closing moments perhaps you're here and you say Pastor Farmer I'll tell you right now I don't ever pray I don't have this relationship with God of which you speak I'm miles away from being a Daniel but you have my interest I would like to talk with someone about what it would mean to start a relationship with God wherein I could talk with him and hear from him like Daniel seems to have heard from God. I, I want that. Secondly, you might be here and you say, Pastor Farmer, I'm a believer. I have a relationship with God. I'm a person of prayer. But I have been running around the city of Atlanta without a church home. I know it's not spiritually healthy. I am drawn to this church and I'd like to talk with someone about what it would mean to be a part of the Crossroads family officially through membership. If I've described you in either of those scenarios, you need to begin a relationship with God or you'd like to unite with this church. As we sing this final song, I'm going to be down here on the floor would you just come forward and I'm going to ask Diane Thornton to stand with me and I'll ask her to take you off to a side room and talk with you about your desire to either begin a relationship with God that is more serious and prayer based or unite with this church. Let's see. Now, beloved, oh, is this on Barbara? This is on Barbara. Oh, this is one of Pamela's you. aunties. How are you, dear? Bless you. Mm -hmm. Say that into the mic. 
this pandemic, I hadn't been able to go to church. Uh, I was a member at y'all uh, AME, but the bus broke down for about two years, and so I just been listening at Dr. Stanley, taking notes with them for the last about three, what, two years, three years. So I need a church home. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Now, beloved, go from this place being a praying people. Yes. There is no shame to the wonderful discipline of prayer. Spend some time with God. It'd be a shame if West Wing or Hunger Games got more hours out of us than did our God. Go from this place, hearing from God and letting God hear from you. The Lord is faithful, continues to speak to us, continues to pour himself into his people. The Lord bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you, and be gracious to you now and forevermore. Yes. Amen.